Diva Corda, um, Fajr Loj, Big and Kid, Agron, so the Bader Strong, the Seminar Hall, Libe Agra, Agling, um, the Civilian, the Palm Off Rowing and Stoto. Um, you're all very welcome to this first online seminar presentation um, organised by the Independent National Commemoration Committee. Um, we're a group based here in Cork. And today we would like to address the issue of the Government of Ireland Act of 1920, the centenary of which occurred just last week, the 23rd of December. Um, earlier this year, the committee here published a very important pamphlet this year, um, detailing what we think are the crucial political points and historical points behind this Government of Ireland Act, uh, being more commonly known, I suppose, by its name, the Partition Act. And we're suffering the legacy or enduring the legacy of that still today. And the proposal wasn't new in 1920, and it certainly wasn't new when the treaty came about. It was, I think, mooted at least in 1913 by Winston Churchill, no less, a man who went on to do the same thing in several other of the British colonies um, of that time, but in later years, in particular India, uh, where they sponsored a sectarian division of the idea of the nation and, and used that as the pretext to split and divide the nation, um, despite the fact that the vast majority of the Irish people had expressed their will through the democratic process on actually on countless occasions down through the years, but most certainly in the nineteen eighteen general election and so on. Um, so to introduce today's topic, um, we have the author of this pamphlet, Tomas Abernethy Hoshe Zoling, and it's Tomas Concursius of Ord doing er Kulra on Achtason Agaser um er Kad Cada own is substant of his um Begistoka Kupitinella um a court tour me doing Erin Dolkiana. So I would like to introduce to you Thomas Thomas Abernethy, who is the author of this pamphlet, uh, to bring the topic to you um the Partition Act and Government of Ireland back nineteen twenty. In a way, RG. So, I'm just going to talk a little bit about partition, how it came about, historical roots, and some of the some interesting facts about it or questions about it. And I suppose the first point is you know, partition came out about in opposition to home rule. And when you think about how strange that is, because when you think what kind of what people would be opposed to. To giving themselves more home rule, more self determination. But in fact, that's exactly what the unionists, those who eventually pushed for partition, did. They wanted opposition not only to home rule in, in what became the six counties of Northern Ireland, they were opposed to home rule for all of Ireland. Um, but of course, eventually they did uh, accept the Stormont Assembly, they did accept home rule. What it was is they weren't necessarily opposed to home rule, they were opposed to majority rule. What bothered them, the unionists, was not the idea of having more control over their own destiny. They, what bothered them and what their obstacle in, in opposition to Home Rule was, is it meant that the majority of the population, you know, with the Irish, would be determining their future. And this is clear in the statements that, that unionists made at the time, in this period of 1912, 1916, and 1918. Um, they clearly did not think that the Irish people were capable of governing themselves. And they certainly weren't capable of governing people who consider themselves to be British. And, uh, you know, you can look at different statements from, from politicians like uh, uh, Andrew Barnard Law, who indicated that he thought the Irish were inferior. You can look at statements from Lloyd George, who said it would be an outrage for those who consider themselves British to be ruled by what he called the remainder of the population. Uh, the remainder of the population in, in plain English would be called the democratic will of the people. So I think the most important thing from a historical point of view to, to realize about partition is it came about in opposition to democracy in Ireland. That was the whole point of this. How can you reflect it? Now, at, at some point they realized, Parson and uh, especially Craig, 
uh, from the Old School Unions Council, realized that he wasn't going to be able to oppose some sort of home rule for the whole island of Ireland. Uh, but they thought then, well, how can we minimize uh, the effect of democracy in Ireland as best we could? And that's how you got these different uh, uh, proposals about the size of the exclusion from home rule, and whether it's going to be nine counties or six counties or whatever. It was all then based, the sermon was talking about, on a sectarian headcount. It was all being devised on how could we exclude as many nationalist people from the area and still have as much area to, to, to control as possible. Um, so this was basically the sectarian uh, basis of Northern Ireland. And what's interesting, of course, is all these justifications that you, you heard then and still now for the creation of this partition of state. And one of them, of course, is, well, you can't force so many people into a, a, a state that they're not comfortable with. You can't force unionists into the United Ireland. But, of course, partition was based on the idea of forcing nationalists, people, for example, in the county of Tyrone and Fermanagh, forcing them into this entity that never existed before, which is called Northern Ireland. So force was, a, was behind the whole rationale of partition. It's, it's creating a state that didn't exist before and forcing people who were never part of that state to become part of it. Uh, it's, you know, six counties of, of northeast of Ulster were never homogeneous. There was always a minority of, uni of nationalists within it, just as there were a minority of unionists within the rest of Ireland. So this whole sort of myth it grew up that somehow Ulster, and when they said Ulster, they meant you know, the union as part of Ulster was somehow some kind of separate entity that required its own government. Just from a historical point of view, this just isn't the case. Uh, in the elections in 1920, for example, uh, the nationalist majority won a seat in Derry. The unionists considered Derry, though, to be the heart of their, their land, and so they, the idea of excluding Derry from uh, this Northern Ireland was impossible for them to consider. So that's why Derry then became part of Northern Ireland. Similarly, if you had excluded Tyrone and Fermanagh, then the state was only four counties would have been too small for them to consider to have been able to govern. So that's why Fermanagh and uh, Tyrone were then forced into Northern Ireland. So if you look at each issue, each justification for this creation of, of Northern Ireland, from a historical point of view, it just doesn't work out. One of the justifications that's always been used as well, which was a way of reducing sectarian tensions. Of course, this, this made no sense at all because people who created Northern Ireland, people like uh, Carson and Craig, were the people who helped to sort of inflame uh, conflict in the north in, in the summer of 1920. It started off in Derry and then in Belfast, where uh, hundreds were killed and thousands were expelled from shipyards. Uh, the Ulster Unionist leadership did nothing to stop that. If anything, they, they, they pushed that on and they, they had good things to say about those who expelled uh, nationalists and Catholic workers from the shipyards. So the idea of, as you say in the book, of, of putting these kind of people in charge of the state and uh, in charge of securing civil and religious liberty uh, for any sector of the population of Ireland doesn't seem to make any sense. And in fact, that's not what happened. Sectarian conflicts went on in the North throughout 1920. 1921 and 1922. Uh, Belfast is one of the most sort of deadly areas in terms of sectarian conflict throughout this, this period. So there was no indication that partition was going to lessen sectarian conflict. It also led, of course, to uh, abuse of civil and religious liberties. The first thing that the, the six county government did when it got into power was do away with proportional representation, which would have at least given some kind of guarantees to, to the, the political minority that was created by the six counties. They did away with that, and that was how they were able to sort of have unionist uh, control for decades after that. So all these things were knowable at the time. In other words, it's not just looking back and saying, well, this was a mistake or that was a mistake. People at the time knew and did criticize uh, what was happening. It's just that their voices weren't, weren't paid attention to and weren't listened to. And it's funny because you, you hear all these revisionist historians who talked about how great John Redmond was and, and John and Joe Devlin and the Nationalist Party. And, you know, if only Irish people had listened to them rather than the Irish separatists, things would have worked out much better. That's kind of a standard line of historians now. But, of course, the people who were in charge and up front in this period when, when partition 
Genesis before this period 1912, 1913, 1914, are exactly those people. John Depp, uh, John Redman, Joe Depp, and these are the, exactly the kind of people, the Constitution and Nationalists, who were in charge of the Irish National Movement at that time. And yet, even these sort of moderate constitutional people are, are seen as being too much by the Unionist leadership. They can't see someone like a John Redmond or a Joe Devlin uh, having leadership of the country. So you hear a lot about this idea that, that you know the Easter Rising is what ruins the chances of Irish unity. Well, partition was, was being talked about and being advocated before the Easter Rising. So the, the opposition to, to Irish unity was developed by people who didn't want Ireland to be ruled by anyone whether it was a constitutional nationalist or anyone else other than a small group of unions and leadership. And so I think that's that's another important thing to, to remember. So the other question, of course, is what does that mean for today? You know, if, if this was performed uh, as a sectarian sort of headcount, you know, why are we giving so much respect to this idea of a six-county entity? Why is it so, you know, even in something like... Uh, or something like that, everyone talks about, you know, you're supposed to move to the Northern Ireland. I mean, the whole state was created to deny Irish democracy. And so you have to wonder why, uh, you know, how we step move forward based on that fact and, and where we go to the next step forward. So, and so and the other, of course, issue is, is the devastation that partition has played in all aspects of Irish life, economically, in terms of transportation, Social life, parishes were split up and divided, and of course the cultural life of the country as well. Uh, the Irish language, you know, had a, in, in terms of the six counties, uh, was very much much disadvantaged. So I think we actually have a speaker who's going to talk specifically about the cultural issues and partition. <laughs> To address this particular question of the culture and language and how it has fared, if you like, in the light of the partition, um, we have a contribution from uh, a Paul Rochelle, a man who has a, a background in academia and in the language uh, development overall. Um, so I think we're able to be joined by Paul live, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Go ahead, Paul. Uh, can you hear me, uh, dear much? Oh, yeah. Am Go I on. audible? Am I only in Tommy Lake Shoss, Will? Oh, okay. Um, okay, well, I, I'll only speak for uh, 15 minutes or less. I could speak for at least one hour on, on this. But, however, I'll, I'll, keep, I'll telescope it right down. Uh, I'm going to recount as to when partition was enacted in 19... Or came into reality, you could say, in 1921. Uh, we had a situation of deep freeze in the land. Uh, and uh, the unions in control made absolutely sure that the status of the language, of the Irish language, would be a minority status, completely unequal, not equal to the other language that, that was English. Um, the situation down south, in contrast, of course, was that in our constitution, of well, 1937, Irish became the first official language, uh, and that is in Article 8 of the Irish Constitution. Uh, and, and indeed, things remained, uh, as I, I would argue, in pretty much deep freeze with a certain amount of melting here and there within the system. Right down to 1998, with the Good Friday Agreement, when under the section on parity of esteem, uh, the area of parity of languages was also breached. Uh, and then this led on to the St. Andrew's Agreement in 2006, uh, when um, the British government committed to the, um, uh, to, to the uh, enactment of, the, of an Irish language act in the Great uh, But of course, this was subsequently refused by the DUP and the UDP, 
and it is still a, a, a fundamental demand that this Acht Negrega is enacted, so that right from the area of signage, Irish court, uh, Irish, an Irish language commissioner, and uh, uh, something akin to our official languages act, which was passed in 2003, and education through Irish, that all of these matters would be encompassed within the act. But it is still a, a major problem, and it was, of course, a major problem, as I mentioned, for the resetting up of the um, executive, the policy of the executive in the moment. Um, now, I'll, I'll summarize these pages as quickly as I can, and um, I will uh, compare, to some extent, the status in the south, the status in the north. But look, looking at this historically, um, as I say, in other parts of Ireland, Irish was the main language in the region of the present-day North, uh, for most of its recorded history. The historic influence of the Irish language in the North will be seen in many places. For example, the name of the house itself, Ferishtu, first appears in the manuscripts in the year 668. And the Lagan, uh, named the name of the Lagan, uh, Owen and Loch Owen, uh, appeared even earlier. The plantation of Ulster, of course, led to disastrous decline in the gain of Irish culture, while some Scottish settlers were Gaelic speakers, English was made widespread by the plantation. Uh, but despite the plantation, Irish continued to be spoken in non-planted areas until the mass migration in the 19th century caused by economic factors. August um, so really and truly what I mean to say is the whole country was, was, was unified within the British Empire right down to 1921. Uh, and what was happening in the north uh, in northern six counties uh, what was mirrored in Dublin and in Cork and in, in, in Galway and elsewhere. So I move on from there. But since the partition of Ireland, the language communities in the Republic and Northern Ireland have taken radically different trajectories. Uh, while Irish is officially the first language in the Republic, in the North, the language has little status at all. Irish in Northern Ireland has declined rapidly with the traditional Irish speaking communities being replaced by learners and great scholarly. Um, so a recent development, of course, also has been the interest shown by some unionists, and particularly in East Belfast, who found out that Irish was not an exclusively nationalist language and had been spoken by unionists, mainly Presbyterians, in Ulster. In the 19th century, fluency in Irish at times was at times a prerequisite to become a Presbyterian minister. Uh, now, the Irish language, Irish Gaelic, however, a recognised minority language has become so. The dialect spoken there is known as Ulster Irish, Gaelge O, as we have Gaelge Hocht, as Gaelge Rio, as Gaelge Foyd, and Marshall. Uh, there are roughly 20 dialects, uh, one can count actually in the Irish. And we speak of four or five today, uh, but there were about 20. So protection for the Irish language in Northern Ireland stems largely from the British government ratifying the European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages in 2001. Um, so, uh, in, in, in Ireland, uh, I'll just take one uh, statistic, and it shows the number of different speakers uh, that, according to the Irish census of 2016, this is the one in the south, uh, that showed that some uh, 6% of uh, the population speak the language weekly and are daily speakers outside the education system. But um, if we can look at the number of native speakers in the Vuelta, it comes out at roughly 20,000. Uh, while those outside the Vuelta, it's 53. So a total, you could say, of the number of people who approximately fill Crow Park, these are the, male, the regular daily speakers of Irish in Ireland, in or around 80,000 people. Uh, in the north, by contrast, uh, it also had a since in 2011, and when you look at that, you see that 10% of people in the North claim to have some knowledge of Irish, while 6% can speak it to varying degrees. It is the home language for 0.2%. So that 0.2%, which is a very important nucleus of language speakers today, compares with our 6%, if you like, the other half. 
Um, so, Shin, 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 but following the partition of Ireland into the Irish Free State in Northern Ireland, the largest Irish speaking area in the former province of Ulster was, of course, Cockney and Gaul. But, look, but luckily for them, they were not subsumed into the uh, six county situation. But however, keep in mind there were great areas uh, in Northern Ireland at the time. And the most prominent of these were the Sperrin Mountains in County Tyrone, and Rathlin Island in County Antrim. I had the privilege actually myself of meeting the last native speaker on uh, Rathlin Island. Uh, the last native speaker of another dialect of Irish, the one of the Isle of Man, died actually in 1974. Um, but since 1921, the Irish language has been regarded with the utmost suspicion by many unionists in Northern Ireland, but associated, of course, with the Republic and with Irish Republic. Um, sure. So, uh, I, I wanted to mention as well the extent to which uh, the loyalists have become more favourable in the sense of the Irish language. For example, a former Red Hand Commando prisoner, William Smith, learned the language whilst in jail. The motto of the Red Hand Commando uh, was the Irish phrase, Love Yarod Ru, which uh, translated, of course, means Red Hand to Victory. Linda Irvine, the sister-in-law, sister former UDF member and politician David Irvine, began learning the language and set up the Trust uh, Irish Language Learning Project, which predominantly uses East Belfast uh, for others to learn the language. Uh, I know Linda Irvine, I've spoken to her. She told me that about 10 years ago, uh, she had roughly 10 to 12 learners of Irish, and now in East Belfast, she's well over 200, and it's increasing all the time. The, the, the interest in it is absolutely phenomenal among the Unionists of East Belfast. Um, yeah. So, uh, okay, just keep in mind before I finish. In the, sorry, am I there? Yeah, I'm nearly finished. In the south, keep in mind all the various positive things that happened at Great Scullina. We have the Great of the Act. We have the Languages Act 2003. We have, of course, Radio the Great of the Tourish .ie. We have the Order on Place Names that uh, is 2004 on Tordu Log Animlecha. Which requires that the Irish original Irish based names be used in the Great of all official documents. Uh, and uh, arising from the Great of Act, we have what's known as the Baltische Vische Great of of which Cork is one. Uh, there are about five or six of these around the country. And there's also, the, which is very interesting at the moment, the South, the setting up of the uh, Irish language records. Well, all of these initiatives were able to happen in the South. They were all frozen in the North, and there was no way they would be accepted or allowed to continue. So, partition in the north meant downgrading of Irish, making it a minority language only not equal in status to English in a sense, freezing of all promotion of the language, legal, community developments, freezing of all belief. Paralysis and uh, for us, in, in a way, what I would argue what was occurred in the north as a result of partition was cultural apartheid in Kina Yaith Khaltu. Uh, the, the maintenance of control was the big issue, both for the unions, of smart and in of the new of the land. So what, what, what happened after partition was you kept the status quo as much as you could. Stad Nehimera, Rivnedi Kahen, Ekimad, Ero, So from all of that in a row, such things as Ulster says no, Ulster will fight and Ulster will be right. And what we have, we hold. But, final point, the deep freeze at the outset, 1921, has actually, I think, begun to melt to a certain degree since the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, even though that freeze, which I mentioned, is still strong in place. Thank you, Paul. Uh, just on the question of culture and language, I think partition really uh, didn't just isolate our northern con fellow countrymen, if you like, on a cultural basis. That in the south, in the southern state is equally artificially created as a division of the nation, and our language and culture have suffered here, I would think, on a par. Yes, we do have official languages at these days and so on, but as I'm sure anyone with a couple of who tries to use it in the official uh, 
uh, manner, we'll very quickly learn that that in itself is a task. And um, so there, this whole question, I suppose, that the national revival in the 1920s and leading up to that was tied up completely with culture and language. And um, today, those two aspects of our nationality <coughs> are equally um, lacking. So Paul Gordil Mahabat asked the, the Korshias er, er, question called two worlds in Tongan. And um, just on the question of the sectarian divide, that was the yardstick dividing the nation back in 1920, as had been carefully worked mm. out in the lead up to it. Um, it was interesting that once partition was then enforced, that actually sectarian attacks were intensified to a series of programs, which I think, you know, anybody fair looking back at the events that took place um, will tell you that the effort was made to incite sectarian divide, for example, and also to, to ensure the division of the working class. I mean, people were expelled out of uh, the shipyard in Belfast who had been labour activists, even positive workers and so on. And people had been ghettoised and driven out of different areas to, invite, to, to ensure a sectarian division um, amongst the people. And similar in the South, the development of an intensely uh, and it's a state intensely tied with the Roman Catholic Church, uh, rather than the Republican ideal of um, people's liberty of conscience and so on. But on the question of um, Tomas, I, I think there's probably been lots of questions raised, and um, maybe you'd like to come back in and, and give us uh, a further development of some of those arguments you've made. One of the, the issues that needs to be addressed is this idea that, and again, many historians, revisionist historians, especially, advocate is this idea that partition was inevitable, that it was the divided nature of Ireland, and therefore this was the only sort of, it was not an ideal solution, but it was the only kind of possible solution. And I think we have to look back at that and, and just reject that. Um, because as you said, there was a sort of a, a national ideal, which is that all of us together living on the island of Ireland are, are equal, we have equal rights and equal liberties, um, and that we have entitled to a government that safeguards those. And of course, the, the Northern Ireland government, the first thing it did, again, it, in addition to sort of imposing and doing away with proportional representation, uh, was introducing something like the Special Powers Act, which was a completely draconian series of, of, of laws and restrictions that remained on the books for decades and made sure that any, any challenge matter what in the political forms uh, that nationalists might have was, was totally repressed and, and, and this is the way that they did it that, you know, came about and, and did things. Um, and I just want to read uh, just real quickly here, there's a recent, there have been a few books that have at least begun the process of at least challenging some of this kind of unionist narrative that's developed over the years and they're starting to look at some of the justifications that have been used for partition and at least questioning some of them, which is, which is what needs to be done. And Robert Lynch has written a book called The Partition of Ireland, and he summarizes at the end, uh, he says, Dividing Ireland entailed a series of ill-conceived and ad hoc responses to unpredictable and unpredicted political developments, ushering in a human tragedy. Indeed, violence was to be the constant background noise to partition. Far from being a necessary evil, reluctantly embraced by all sides to drive on more enlightened goals of freedom and democracy. Partition was, in a very real sense, brought about through violence and the threat of force. And he talks, as, as you mentioned before, about the two states. And he says, the two states which accidentally emerged in 1921 remain deeply artificial and compromised. And I think that's that's kind of the legacy that we're looking at is a compromise of ideals in terms of uh, equality and civil liberties um, that came about because of this allowing this sectarian uh, headcount to determine the scope of the national jurisdiction. And we're living with that legacy today, of course, uh, in everything from, from Brexit to, to the medical system. Um, so these aren't simply academic or historical questions that we're dealing with. And what I guess we would put forward and propose is this idea that uh, 
it should be all the people of Ireland to determine you know, how and when we go forward with, with Irish unity. And the idea that people from Cork or from Cavan or from Kerry should have no say in that, right? So it, that the, the question should be determined either solely by the British government or by this six county jurisdiction that they created. I think we can start to look back and look now at that question and say, no, that really, given the historic uh, roots of partition, that all the people of Ireland, again, people here in Cork and elsewhere in Ireland, should be saying, we want unity and we're making that clear, and that's what should happen in this country. I think that's an important uh, reclaiming the, the, the rights that, that were brought forward in this period of 1920, the right to self determination um, and the right of equality for all people. Uh, um, just to bring matters to a close, um, this has been the first effort in having an online seminar or conference or presentation, if you like, and we hope to do a lot more in the coming 12 months. Um, as I said at the outset, this event, if you like, is coming at the end of 2020. I think this, this year we organized 60 or 70 odd uh, commemorative events at Mark three important events in our national history that took place throughout 2020. We had other plans which we curtailed because of this COVID crisis and so on uh, for parades and that mark important centenaries in Cork, Murder, Moss, uh, Macaulay Dawn, um, Lawrence Maxwell's death, Hunger Strike, along with John Martin and Dick Victor and so on, Corning and Cork. A lot of big major events we didn't address as we hoped to, but we're going to continue and there's a lot a lot more as the national struggle intensified in 1921 and a lot more um, events need to be marked and it, it's our aim to mark the the loss of every single volunteer um man or woman alike if you like and in fact the role of women and common man in particular um we didn't address hugely in 2020 um even though we had tried to find the basis for doing that but to try and make up some ground, the very first commemorative event we host this year or in, in the coming year uh, will take place on Saturday, the 2nd of January, at the site of the old women's prison in Summers, well, here in Cork, where we're going to have an event to commemorate um, the women of Common and their contribution to our national movement, which of course was an absolutely essential, critical element of the whole uh, national movement. So. We invite you to join us there if you're local. Um, there will be videos, as there are many online. I think you may have an address in front of you of our Facebook page, Air. There's facebook.com, Air. We'll get it for you. And there's links there to YouTube, and you'll see a lot of um, the events we've done so far. So, let's see, for me, Slanev, I was a Gachda Guidi from Avlian Lua, I was a Mermaid Bjorgen officer, Lishman, there's that. She's not going to be gone.